wonder if you'd stand with me for just a moment. The indescribable one is in this place today. The one who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords is in this house today. The one who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or think is in this place today. The one who is the great I am is in this place today. He is the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah to your name, O Lord. And we worship you, Lord. We glorify your name. We acknowledge you for who you are today. We bow before you. Surrender our all to you today. For you alone are worthy. Church, is he the only one worthy of your praise today? Would you just lift your hands with me a little bit longer this morning? Let's acknowledge him in our own lives today. Not just about what we want today, what we need today. It's about who he is in this place today. We acknowledge his presence, his power, his might here today. Glory to your wonderful name. Glory to your wonderful name, Jesus. As we walked up the sidewalk to come into the house of God this morning, I sense a stirring in my heart that God is doing something unusual in His church today. In this place, God is at work. And there was an expectancy in my heart, an expectancy deep in my spirit, something that was saying to me that the Lord is not finished, that you've not reached the pinnacle, that you've not yet got to the top of what God is about to do. You're still climbing. You're still moving upward and inward. And I just sense that today God is bringing new and fresh momentum, the momentum of His Spirit in your hearts today by what he's doing both through his touch in your life and the word that just resonates in your spirit today so as i sense that as we walked in and as we were greeted there was just a welcomeness in this place i'll be there's some arms that are extended they're the arms of the lord today for others who will come and i just want to tell you this morning i believe that there are others that are coming that you are to prepare yourself for there are others who are coming and then all nations of the world would be represented in this place today. I believe there is a drawing of God's Spirit because there's hungry men and women. They're tired of the same old, same old. They're tired of tradition. They're tired of being shut down and locked up and held back. And they're looking for a place where there can be freedom and a place where they can lift their hands and a place where they can worship God they're looking for a place where they can use their gifts and their talents and they can be God's person for the hour. Listen, the Lord is opening a door. The Lord is preparing the way. You're moving with the Lord and there is a time before you now. I believe God moving you to that place of His highest will where this church will reach and fulfill its greatest kingdom potential. You think you've seen it. You think it's in the past. You think it's something that happened yesterday. But let me tell you, what God is about to do exceeds what He's done before. And what God has prepared, can I tell you right now, the latter will be greater than the former. The thing that God will do will complete His purpose and His plan for this house. Because we're living in the last days. These are urgent hours. We've been called to do a work today. And I believe this church is ready to take its place in the arsenal of God, in the weaponry of the Lord, to be a mighty, mighty force in the kingdom of God. I speak that over this church today with great joy, and I thank God for what He is going to do in your midst today. Can we praise Him today for that? We bless your name, O Lord. We bless your name, O Lord. 
Brother Mike, it is a joy to be with you and Sister Judy today. You are friends of ours. We've worked together in so many areas. God has been gracious to provide this fellowship with us. And what a joy to be in the church today. Amen. Congregation, thank you for letting me come and spend this time with you. I thought I was going to have my brother all the way through the preaching this morning. I may need you to come back, my brother. I see you're, you're sitting on ready. That chair has a word written there. That's ready right there. Amen. You can be seated for just a moment, but I'm going to ask you to stand a moment to, to read the word. But uh, I want to just say one more thing. Uh, Trisha and I pastored. Am I going to be okay standing here? Am I going to? I'm not going to not going to get too close and spit on anybody this morning. If you're in the first few rows, you can be sprinkled all over again, right? Uh, as as we begin to enter in with you in worship today, uh, I just sense that God has put a spirit of David in the house, and I thank the Lord for all the youth that I saw on the platform. And I see uh, I see some warriors today. Some warriors of worship today. And can I just encourage you to pursue that? Can I just tell you not to let go of that, but to hold on to that? Because it's in that wonderful presence of God that mighty things can take place. Lives will be transformed. And uh, we will see the kingdom of God move forward as we, as we invite him to tabernacle among us. And when God tabernacles among us, did you know that he has a mobile throne? That his throne is not stationed or positioned in one place, but his throne will move where the praises are. He will dwell in your praise. And if you want the Lord to come and move in the service, then begin to praise him and exalt him, and then he will tabernacle in us. Amen. So I just want to encourage you, it's not about the preacher, not even about type of song that you're singing as long as that song is glorifying God but it's the heart of God's people who are lifted to him to say Lord we want you to be in this place today so we just invite him to be in this service today if you have your Bible would you turn with me I want to look together with you for a few minutes I'm not a long-winded preacher but it is 10 minutes to 12 I've had two people say take your watch off forget about it I don't know that the entire church would feel that way today especially since the ladies have prepared. But I do want to just deliver what's on my heart because if a preacher can't deliver what's on his heart, he's miserable. If you don't let me preach this this morning, I'm going to have to find somebody to preach it to. And if I, if I have to, I'll preach to Tricia today. <laughs> She's heard it before and she'll say amen and she'll be with me tomorrow uh, despite the message. But in Luke chapter 7, I want to read a very familiar passage. And I forgot my glasses this morning. And I'm blind in this eye and can't see out of this one. But we're going to do our best today. Uh, I don't know if yours will help me, Mike. I don't think they're strong enough, brother. But I'll be all right today. You have a big print. You all are just so gracious. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll, we'll uh, be all right here. But would you stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's word? Luke chapter 7, I want to begin in verse 11. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. Look at your neighbor and say, a dead man. You don't need me to define today what a dead man is. You understand what the scripture is saying. He was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, Arise. And I tell you, that's the message of the church today. Arise. Get up from where you are. Don't stay where you've been. Don't be held back by your past, limited by someone else's words over you. But get up. 
So he who was dead sat up. Are you surprised at that today? Are you surprised that when the Lord makes a statement like that and someone obeys that in fact what he says happens? He who was dead sat up and began to speak and he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all and they glorified God saying, A great prophet has risen among us. God has visited his people and this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. I want to preach for a few minutes on the church that brings life. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today and for the privilege we have this morning to be able to come and just to sense your presence and to know of your fullness and your power. And Lord, to be aware that we are not alone. But we have come as the great throng of God today, gathered with those heavenly hosts. And Lord, we are worshiping you right now in spirit and in truth. I pray right now that you would quicken our hearts and our minds, that you would draw us so near to you today. And I pray that the real preacher, the Holy Spirit, would speak in between my words. That Lord, you would tug on the hearts of your people, that you would bring into every life today the revelation of your word. Lord, let it be clear from you. Lord, and if I'm confusing this morning, you be clear, O oh God. If I'm not straight to the point today, you be straight to the point today. And Lord, you bring into our lives what we need through your word. Thank you that you honor the preaching, the foolishness of the preaching of your word today. But Lord, we do it as unto thee with your strength and for your glory. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, Amen, amen and Amen. Luke begins his gospel with words from the angel. And they are the only words, I think, that are fitting for the life of Jesus Christ. They're the only words that can describe his birth. And the words are this, Nothing shall be impossible with God. Those words of the angel linger all the way through the pages of the gospel message. Until we get to this most important place in Scripture where Jesus is making his earthly journey, doing the Father's will. The Bible tells us that he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. So you know where he's headed. He's going to become the lamb that is slain before the foundation of the earth. He is going to offer himself up as a sacrifice supreme that you and I, who are lost and undone, can come to know Jesus Christ and can experience life eternal. What I love about Luke is his descriptive words concerning this specific miracle of the Lord. This is not some story, not some outlandish imagination of Luke. These are real words, the words of the Spirit, as given to Luke, an eyewitness of the account. What I love about the Gospels is these men have witnessed these things for themselves. How many here this morning, you've experienced something from God, and you're not just someone who can hear what someone else has said. You're an eyewitness. Say amen. You saw it with your own eyes. You heard it with your own ears. You experienced it. You were there. You understand salvation because you were saved. You understand what it means to be sanctified because you've been sanctified. You know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know what it is to be healed because you've been healed. Well, Luke comes in that same way, and he brings to us the story of Jesus coming now to this specific place. What I love about Luke's words is he's describing for us the journey of Christ. But what I see here is more than just the journey of the Lord. I see a picture of the church. Here is this great group of men and women. When you read the opening verses of this miracle, the Bible tells us they're making this day's journey. They're probably arriving in the city of Nain sometime near supper. And the Bible says, And many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. Who are we talking about? Well, in that day, we know clearly that Jesus has been somewhere 
and he's going somewhere. And along the way, there have been some lives who have been transformed. There have been some people who have experienced his power and his might. And they're anxious to see. They're excited. There's an expectancy in their heart like the Lord put in my heart when I came into the service today. He put that same expectancy in yours too, I'm sure. But there's something in the heart that says something is going to happen when I follow this man, Jesus Christ. And because He has transformed my life, because He's made a difference in me, I know that God is going to do the same for somebody else and I want to be there to witness it for myself. To me, that is a picture of the church. When you go back in the pages before this particular chapter, you find miracle after miracle. Jesus, with the grace of heaven and the power of Almighty God, bringing healing and deliverance to everyone who comes near. In one particular passage, just a chapter before, the Bible tells us that Jesus heals a great multitude. That every, the Bible says specifically that every single one of them were healed. He healed them all. I believe the disciples are a part of this crowd. I believe those who were healed by the Lord are with Him now. And they're making their way to this city to see what Jesus is about to do. I want to tell you today that you are a part of a church and you're a part of a church that is moving somewhere. I want you to see the movement of the church this morning. The movement of the church is that we are going somewhere with Jesus. Do you know that they were headed to a city? We are a church that is headed to a city whose builder and maker is God. I want to tell you this morning that we have before us a great leader. He is the shepherd of our faith. He is the lover of our soul. He is the one who died for us and rose again. His name is Jesus Christ. And He is the Prince of Life. And wherever the Lord goes and wherever the church goes with Him, there will be light. You are the tree of life fellowship. Can I tell you, there's a word for you in just a few verses there. The tree is known by His fruit. I started to preach on that in chapter 6, Brother Mike, but the Lord didn't let me stop in 6 and went on to 7. But that, those few words there, uh, beginning in the, in the 40s, is a powerful word for you. There's fruit in this house. There's good fruit in this house. There's fruit in this house that brings life, that brings refreshment. There's fruit in this house that is good to the soul. But that's another message. Jesus is making his way, and the church is in movement, in step with him. Can I tell you, the church is not in step with the spirit of the world today. We're out of step with the world today. That's why you're struggling where you are, because you're out of step with the world today. You're not in sync with the political world today. You're not in sync with the world of economy today. We're not, by the way, we're not on the gold standard. We're on the God standard. And so we don't live by the gold standard and materialistic things are not priority for us. God provides us everything that we need for life and for righteousness and we take Him at His word and say, Lord, if you've asked me to do it, you'll pay for it and provide it. But can I tell you today that this church is moving with the Lord. They're in flow with God. And if you just let me use my sanctified imagination for a few moments, I know that Luke doesn't make this clear for us, but if there are those people who are part of the multitude and they are following Jesus and they've just come from one miracle to another, I don't believe this is a funeral procession. I don't believe this group of people is quiet. I don't believe they've got frowns on their faces. I don't believe they're down. I don't think they look like they just ate persimmons. I don't think they are grumpy. I don't think they're upset. I don't think they're distraught. I don't think they're hopeless. I think they're filled with joy about what the Lord has just done and about what He's about to do for somebody else. And there is a lot of laughter that's taking place again. That's my sanctified imagination. But I'm preaching now. You can preach another time if Mike will let you. And you can tell your side of the story. But I just know that these are people who are overflowing with joy. 
Oh, I'll never forget the day Jesus saved me. What a joy-filled life I had from that point on. And I've learned in life that you think you have seen it all and you think you've understood it all and you think God could do nothing greater than He's done before, but then you realize every step of the way is miracle after miracle. Every step of the way is God's touch after touch and another experience in His presence that would exceed the one before. So here's the church. We see the movement of the church, the church with Jesus Christ. We see the multitude of the church. And I tell you, you're not alone today. You gather here on Highway 29. In my mind, I'd put you on Highway 29 Expressway. Drove by there today and you weren't there, so I... <laughs> We were going to have church and I was going to preach without you this morning on the Danville Expressway. And I said, no, let's go up here and turn around. They're on 29 business. God's put you here, but you're not alone. There are men and women, boys and girls, there are teenagers all over this world that are serving God, loving God, a heart to see God do some amazing things, hungry for what the Lord will do in their own life, in need of Him today as He was with them in the past. Oh God, the prayer is, God, be with us today. Listen, there are other people who are worshiping, other people who are hearing the Word of God, other people who are responding to His power. There is a multitude of people today who are out of step with the world but are in step with Jesus Christ. You're not alone this morning. There's another multitude the Scripture brings pretty clear for us, and that multitude really becomes the mandate of this church. There is a... And this hits my spirit so heavy today. So heavy in my heart today that many in the church are not aware of this other multitude. Many in the church today who are satisfied with us for and no more Many who are happy with just the way life has treated them and they're content that there might be an empty seat in front of them or to the right or to the left of them and there is someone yet to hear the good news. There's a multitude that becomes the mandate of the church and it's this other processional that's headed out of the city is our mandate. Take a moment with me and think about this other procession. The Bible gives us great description. It shows us very specifically what the Lord wants us to see. We have an opportunity to get a picture of the world, of those in a lost condition. The Bible says that when they came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. The church was headed to the city, but this woman, her dead son, and the multitude of mourners are headed to the cemetery. The church is moving in with great hope, but this procession of death has left this family in a place of hopelessness. I want you to see this, this widow, and my heart gets heavy when I think about her plight and her condition. Here is a woman who has made this journey before. She's come this way before. The other time she came, it was with her son. And the other time she came, it was her husband who was in the coffin. And they made their way to the cemetery. Here is a woman now who comes alone and her only son is dead. And she will take that only son and put him in the cemetery and she'll come back to a house of one. She'll prepare a meal for one. She'll sleep in a house and be alone. And all the provisions of her future are buried in that cemetery. For in that day there is no provision for a widow. She had hoped she'd live the rest of her days with this son and he would take care of her. But now all of her hopes and all of her dreams and everything about her future has been put or will be put in this cemetery. 
To me, it shows a picture, a clear picture of the hopelessness of our world today, of men and women who have nothing but the shadow of death over their life. There's been a death in their finances. There's been death in their relationships. There's been a death in their marriage. There's been a death of their hopes and their dreams, of all the things that they could see possible. Now, those things are no longer possible. There is a desperate condition in their heart. What can I do? How will I live? What will be the future for my life and for my family? Here is a woman who is going now to great despair to walk the last few steps of her life because once she leaves the cemetery, she might as well lay down and die herself. And look at that dead boy. We live in a society where far too many young people die. Cut down by drugs. Cut down by the things that dominate our world today. I want to talk to a young person right now, and you, your hope factor is low this morning. You've been trying to figure out how things are going to work out in your life. You sense the desperateness. You sense the hopelessness that is here. But can I tell you, there's about to be a holy collision. And I tell you that something's about to take place that either the funeral procession is going to make its way by or the procession of our Lord is going to make its way by, but both of them can't go by. I want to just tell you for a moment that when I think about church folks, and I've pastored for about 27 years, and I think I know church folks fairly well, they're very reverent people. They understand the condition, the need of someone else. And so I would imagine that as they walk with Jesus disciples included, that when they saw the procession making its way out of town, and here is a procession of death, and this woman has hired mourners from the city, and they are wailing to the top of their lungs. They're dressed in cloaks of, of black, and they're making their way. All the city knows there's been a great loss. All the city knows someone has died. All the city knows the pain of this widow with her only son. And so the city is aware of this great tragic loss. So the respectful thing to do for anyone is get out of the way and make provision for this ceremony of death to make it safely to the cemetery. So I see as those two great groups are meeting that all of a sudden the church folks, sanctified imagination now, they begin to get out of the way. We do that in our society, don't we? We pull the cars over. We bow our heads. We respect the dead. The same thing is true there. You respect the dead. You respect the living who've had great loss. And so they begin to move out of the way. And the laughter and the joy and the talking and the worshiping that's been going on, it all gets quiet. And they get reverent. And they step aside, making way for the procession to go on to the cemetery. But you know what? Jesus doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, when I read this scripture, I find he does just the opposite. And it's not important really what, the, you know, what my imagination is about what the church might do. The point is, I want you to see what Jesus did. I want you to see that he doesn't get out of the way of death. He doesn't get out of the way of disaster. He doesn't step back from grief. He doesn't step back from pain. He doesn't step back from disappointment. He doesn't get out of the way of your child who is strung out on drugs. He doesn't get out of the way of your family that's under the burden of a financial debt. He doesn't step aside to anything in this world today. Why? Because He is the Prince of Life. He is the Redeemer. He is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. He has power in His hand to change every situation. And oh, I see today in my heart the church is just like that. We're following Jesus Christ and we don't step side to anything the enemy throws our way. We stand strong in our faith and our dependency upon the Word of God and we speak God's Word. Where there is death, God brings life. Jesus does just what He always does. He steps up to the situation. No matter how difficult it might be, our Lord makes a way 
where there seems to be no way. And I'm glad today He does because He did it for me. I'm glad Jesus stepped into my life one day when I was lost and undone. When I was on my way to hell, Jesus stepped in and He rescued me. And He put His arms around me. And He loved me when I couldn't be loved. And He reached me when I didn't think I could be reached, like this song said today. And He embraced my life so that I could have hope. That's the kind of Lord we serve today. Look at verse 13. When the Lord saw her, He had compassion upon her. You could preach an entire message about the compassion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you really can't describe it. You can't explain it. You can only use the words of God to really tell the story. But those of you who have experienced it, Know it like I do. It's something that totally captivates your heart. Jesus will captivate you. Jesus will just compel you with His love for you. Jesus will put His arms around you. You can't describe it, but it will just empty you of all of your worry and your fear. The Lord saw her. He had compassion on her, and He said to her, Do not weep. And when we read that in the King James Version, it's a little bit blind. But I went back and dug into the original text. And you know, in fact, that what Jesus says here is not just a simple statement acknowledging the grief of that widow. Jesus makes a word of declaration. It's actually a prophetic word. The word is, you shall weep no more. You shall weep no more. He makes a declaration to this woman that I know what's about to happen in your life. I know the change I'm about to bring in your circumstances. I know the hopelessness is going to be met with great hope today. I know your great sorrow is going to be met with a wonderful joy and it will fill your life and overflow. You shall weep no more. Can I tell you that's what the Lord is saying in the house today. You've wept over it long enough. You've cried about it long enough. You've been mourning over it long enough. But the Lord says you shall shall weep no more. And he came and he touched the open coffin. Those who cared him stood still. Sanctified imagination again. When you stop the hearse, everything else behind it stops. But people behind the hearse aren't used to stopping. They're mourning and weeping. And when you stop the hearse, something has gone wrong. And so all of a sudden, they begin to pile up. They begin to look around and say, who has stopped the funeral procession? Well, it's Jesus. He's interrupted what's going to happen today. And the Bible says he puts his hand on this coffin. It's a wicker basket of sorts. It's open. You can see the boy laying there. Their men carry him. He has compassion upon the woman. He says, you shall weep no more. He touches the coffin. And those who carry him stand still. And then he utters what I believe is the message of the church. He says very simply, young man, I say to you, arise. Do you remember the day when the Lord spoke to your heart? Do you remember the day when the words of life came directed at you and the Lord said, get up from where you are. You've been sitting there too long. You've been locked up in your past too long. You've been held back by the sins of your life too long. You've had mom and daddy say this to you and others who have said that to you. Those are not true things. What I say to you is get up from where you are. There's a part that we need to play in our walk with the Lord. And the Lord speaks to us and He says, Arise and we get up. This young man was dead. And yet the Bible says, So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. I had somebody ask me one day, Pastor, what did that young man say? The Bible doesn't say what he said, but I put myself on the dead man's shoes. And I'll tell you what he said. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. And if you're living in the South, he probably said something like, 
Listen, I'm not going to the cemetery. I'm going back home with Mama, and we're going to have some cornbread and beans because I'm hungry. And he probably said something else. Hey, grave diggers, you can fill the hole in. I'm not going to the cemetery today. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. Because of Jesus Christ, I live. Aren't you glad this morning that that's the message of the church? Aren't you glad today that that's the evidence that He lives in this place? There are new lives being saved every day. The Bible says, Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited His people.